So this is becoming a bit of a trend. I buy a brand new framework laptop and right out of the box, it's got enough issues that customer support ends up sending me a full replacement. This is the second time it's happened. The first being with the framework 16. On the bright side, Frameworks customer support was quick, responsive, and had a new unit on my doorstep in under a week. So while the full review of the Framework 12 is up on my main channel, today on Lifting Linux, we're diving into how well this thing handles Linux. Let's get into it. Welcome to Lifting Linux, where we open the door to open source. I'm CJ, and this is my Linux review of the Framework 12 2-in-1 laptop. Now, like I mentioned earlier, if you're looking for a full deep dive on this machine, covering the essentials like build quality, display, keyboard, trackpad, speakers, camera, mic, battery life, and general performance, you can check that out here or hit the link in the description. Today, we'll touch on a few of those things, but the focus is today on how this laptop handles running a Linux operating system. I didn't get too fancy with my distro choice, while Framework is arguably a Windows first manufacturer, they're also one of the most Linux friendly PC makers out there. They work directly with Linux distribution teams and even offer official support for several distros. As of today, the Framework 12 officially supports Fedora, Ubuntu, and Bazite. There are also four community supported options, Project Bluefin, Arch Linux, Linux Mint, and NixOS. That said, if you're a more experienced Linux user, you can likely get just about any distro working on this laptop. But for Fedora, Ubuntu, and Bazite, Framework has partnered with the maintainers to provide step-by-step -step installation guides, full hardware compatibility, and support for automatic firmware updates via the Linux vendor firmware service. So no need to jump through hoops to update BIOS. Most importantly, these three distros come with official framework support. So if something breaks, they can help you fix it. It's also worth noting that features specific to a two-in-one device like touchscreen support, auto screen rotation, and disabling the keyboard and trackpad when folded aren't well supported across all desktop environments. GNOME and KDE Plasma offer the best out of the box experience in that regard. So for this review, I'll be using officially supported Fedora 42 with the GNOME desktop. I also repeated all the testing with KDE Plasma. Now I'm not gonna go too deep into the installation process. Framework already provided a clear step-by-step -step guide, but I'll point out where I deviated from it. Since some of you, especially those new to Linux, might want to do the same, I opted for a dual boot setup, installing Fedora alongside Windows 11. The Fedora installer makes this surprisingly easy. It automatically detects Windows, defaults to a dual boot configuration, and shows how much free space is available on the SSD, and lets you choose how much of that you want to allocate to Fedora. It'll then shrink the Windows partition and handle creating all the necessary Linux partitions for you. Secure Boot and TPM 2.0 are fully supported and configurable in BIOS, so you can run signed distros like Fedora and Ubuntu and Windows Dual Boot without any hiccups, or turn them off if you're doing something more custom. The rest of the installation went smoothly, and unlike the early days of the Framework 13, once Fedora is installed, there's no long list of extra steps required to get everything working. Aside from running a standard system update, there's nothing you need to do in the terminal. So if you're new to Linux, you can ease into the command line at your own pace. But does everything actually work and work well without any tweaking? Well, I started with the basics. I folded the laptop into tablet mode and the screen auto-rotated. The physical keyboard and trackpad were disabled as I expected. The touchscreen responded instantly and when I tapped on a text box, a virtual keyboard popped up. Folding it back into laptop mode, rotated the screen back and re-enabled the keyboard and trackpad. Nailed it. Right there checks off about 90% of what matters in a Linux 2-in-1 review. Now, Linux on convertible laptops has historically been hit or miss, but thanks to the continued improvements in GNOME and KDE Plasma, along with modern user space demons like IIO sensor proxy, frameworks use of supported hardware sensors, and properly implemented embedded controller and ACPI firmware that actually reports sensor data to the OS, this was a seamless experience. 
Now, apologies to the Linux newcomers for getting a little nerdy there, but I want to give you some foundational knowledge to help you pick the right distro for the Framework 12. Not every distribution works out of the box. For example, long-term support distros like Debian may ship with outdated sensor demons in their repos. On the other hand, rolling releases like Arch often require you to manually configure and enable those demons. And just to clarify, demon spelled like this, refers to an invisible background process that runs without user interaction. The term comes from some MIT nerds back in the 60s. Now, while full-featured desktop environments like GNOME and Plasma offer solid two-in-one support, lighter options like XFCE, LXQT, Mate, or even Cinnamon might have little to no support and could require scripting things manually. In my experience, Cinnamon does have great touchscreen support, but I've always had to manually configure auto-rotation and keyboard lockout using custom UDEV rules or SystemD services. But if anyone out there is running Linux Mint with Cinnamon on the Framework 12, drop a comment and let us know how it's working. Also worth mentioning, Wayland handles sensor integration much better than X11. If you're still using X11, you might need additional tools or scripts for proper rotation support. And in my experience, X11 doesn't handle touch or stylus input nearly as gracefully. But we'll circle back to all of this in my final thoughts. Now, let's move on to the rest of the hardware compatibility, specifically stylus or pen support. I didn't get a chance to test this in my full review of the Framework 12, so I wanted to make sure I covered it here. I'm using the HP rechargeable MPP 2.0 tilt pen, and my first test was to fire up Krita and check line fidelity. Using a non-metallic straight edge, I drew an angled line, and zooming in, you can definitely see some jitter. That's about what I expected from this display. Keep in mind, this isn't a high-end or even mid-tier panel for art or graphic work. With a bit of settings adjustment, variable pressure sensitivity works, and tilt shading you know, kind of works, but I did notice input latency creeping in once you start laying down more pixels. Combine that with the limited color gamut and lack of color accuracy, and no, this isn't something I'd recommend for digital artists. However, for digital note-taking, it gets the job done. My handwriting is garbage and the glossy screen plus smooth stylus tip doesn't help, but palm rejection seems to work reliably and for simple handwriting, latency isn't much of a problem. So yeah, pen support on Linux, it's a go. The next thing I tested, something that can still be hit or miss on Linux, was external display and docking. Fortunately, both GNOME and Plasma now fully support Wayland, so you won't run into the typical X11 headaches with mixed resolutions or refresh rate displays. I ran a 1440p 144Hz display directly off the HDMI and DisplayPort expansion cards, and everything just worked. Off camera, I also tested a bunch of other combinations ranging from 1080p to 5K ultra wide with zero issues. I also set up a single cable USB-C dock. This one's a generic USB 4 hub, and even though the Framework 12 for USB-C expansion cards are limited to USB 3.2 Gen 2, Everything worked flawlessly. One USB cable powered an external monitor, keyboard and mouse, 2.5 gigabit ethernet, and even delivered power to the laptop while still letting me use the framework's built-in touchscreen as an input device. And that's a pretty slick setup. My one piece of advice, avoid USB hubs or docks that are specifically designed for Macs, brands like CalDigit or OWC, these often rely on Mac-specific drivers or software like DisplayLink for full functionality, especially when it comes to external displays. Sticking with hubs that use standard USB protocols is the safer bet for Linux users. Also, while I had no problem using a USB 4 compatible dock in fallback mode, it's just USB 3.2, so don't expect PCI tunneling or eGPU support here. Refreshingly, I had zero issues with the Wi-Fi adapter. The connection was strong and stable, and surprisingly, I got faster speeds on my Wi-Fi 6E network than I did in Windows on this laptop. I was consistently hitting over gigabit speeds on my home network, which was a nice bonus. Bluetooth worked just as smoothly. Battery 100%. Connected to Fedora. Now, the Framework 12 speakers aren't great, but with a bit of tuning in Linux, they can actually sound decent. Framework even provides a pre-built EasyFX profile that gives the audio a noticeable boost. That said, sound quality is subjective, and to my ears, it sounds a bit over-processed. It's fine for music,
but the aggressive filtering becomes obvious with vocals. Hard consonants like T's and D's can produce sharp, unnatural clicks due to transient distortion. Only on par with Windows, and can NVIDIA's open source push reshape the landscape of Linux gaming and local AI? I've benchmarked both cards across 20 gigs. It's one of those cases where more isn't always better. Still, with a little tweaking, you can probably dial in a profile that works for your ears. And yes, there's a headphone jack on the Framework 12, and it worked right out of the box. The camera and microphone work out of the box with no further setup. Looking at the output, exposure levels are good. I got a slight hot spot in my head, but there is a studio light right above me. However, color reproduction looks a bit weak. However, that's probably more due to the poor color gamut and accuracy of the Framework 12 display. For example, those LED fans behind me are a deep red, but they look orange on screen. And my shirt looks like it's 10 years old and completely washed out, while in reality, it's a nice deep blue with good contrast between the red and black artwork that looks gray and pink on screen. The microphone is way more sensitive on Fedora than it was on Windows. I have it turned down to about 25% and it's still picking up the fan noise and occasionally clipping, but you're looking and listening to the raw output right now so you can determine for yourself uh, how it looks and sounds. Out-of-the-box support also includes hardware accelerated video playback and web rendering, so those tasks are offloaded to the integrated GPU instead of the CPU. Much more energy efficient, as you'd expect with Wayland and an Intel processor. Both GNOME and Plasma on Fedora include power profiles right in the system tray, and they work pretty much the same as they do in Windows. Running the Framework 12 in balanced mode through my usual workload, script writing, data processing, and web browsing, I saw nearly identical battery life to Windows 11, about five hours from a full charge to 20%. The one default setting I'd recommend changing is sleep behavior. By default, it uses S2 idle, which drains about eight to 10% battery every 12 hours while the laptop's asleep. Switching to deep sleep mode drastically improves standby efficiency. The only trade-off is needing to press the power button to wake it, but on Fedora, wake times was just a few seconds, totally worth it. For those who like to fine tune power usage tools like TLP or auto CPU free can give you more granular control. That said, in my experience, if a device already performs similarly on Linux and Windows in terms of efficiency, there's usually not much more to gain without sacrificing noticeable performance. Thermals and fan behavior under Fedora were also solid. In the balance profile, the fan stayed quiet during light use. In the performance profile, the fan was noticeably more aggressive. You've probably heard it in the webcam test, but it behaved almost identical to how it did in Windows. Finally, let's take a quick look at some performance. One area where Linux tends to have an edge over Windows is in how it schedules tasks across modern CPUs with performance and efficiency cores. Thanks to better thread handling and scheduler tuning, especially in newer kernels, Linux can squeeze a bit more multi-core performance out of the same hardware. For example, comparing Geek bench six scores on the framework 12 running Fedora versus Windows 11, I saw an almost 8% bump in multi-core performance on Fedora, even with the relatively modest Core i3-1350U, which only has six cores, two performance, and four efficiency, that's a solid gain considering the limited headroom. Battery-only performance showed similar dips across both platforms, though Fedora is slightly more aggressive with throttling when using best efficiency power mode. Interestingly, Fedora also showed about a 14.5% better single-core performance in some tests, though your mileage may vary depending on kernel version and governor settings. One area where Windows still pulls ahead is in OpenCL compute performance. The Intel GPU drivers for Linux aren't as optimized as their Windows counterparts, so I saw around an 11% drop in iGPU compute scores under Fedora. But in real world use, you probably won't notice much difference. Whether you're running Windows or Linux, the Framework 12 feels just as snappy for jet tasks. For those of you who like digging into the numbers, I ran my full benchmark suite as usual. You'll find the result links in the description if you want to dive deeper. And for my fellow Linux devs looking for a quick gut check on raw performance of the Framework 12, compiling Linux kernel version 6.15 took 376.52 seconds or just over six minutes. 
Before we wrap up, I want to quickly revisit a few points from my initial Framework 12 review, mainly the two biggest topics that came up in the comments and on the forums, quality insurance controls and chassis flex. Starting with the flex, I mean, it is what it is. I'm not using my obvious Herculean strength. I'm literally just holding it and twisting it with my wrist slightly. This is far less pressure than I usually apply when twisting metal body laptops, but I'm still seeing noticeable flex and here it creaks. Now, chassis flex doesn't automatically mean a laptop isn't durable, but it's a standard thing I do with all laptops I review. In this case, there's a secondary issue. Because this laptop requires two hands to open, I typically hold down the bottom with my left hand and lift the lid from the right corner. That motion flexes the top panel, and I've noticed the LCD bleed in the top right corner, right where the panel clips into the lid, has gotten worse over time. So now it seems flexible parts designed to absorb stress are passing that stress to more fragile components like the screen. And if anyone says I'm opening it wrong, please forward your resume to the Genius Bar. You're definitely Apple qualified. As for the QA issues that led me to needing a replacement, it doesn't matter how new, small, or niche a company is. Proper quality assurance needs to be baked into every step of the manufacturing process. There should have been multiple checkpoints where the three major issues I experienced were caught long before this laptop made it into a box. Now, I'll link a video showing the full manufacturing process of a B-Link mini PC I reviewed a while back. Watch it and you'll see that more than half the people on that line aren't installing parts, they're verifying the last step was done correctly and testing components. That's QA, QC in action. Now, in fairness, the replacement framework I just received looks solid so far. I just unboxed it and haven't swapped over the components yet. That's next once I finish filming, but this will be the unit I use for long-term testing, but that's for much later. Now let's wrap up my Linux review of the Framework 12. Overall, the Framework 12 is the best out-of-the-box Linux-ready laptop Framework has produced so far. I mean, even five years later, the Framework 13 still doesn't provide proper ALS tuning or filtering logic to make auto brightness work correctly under Linux. And don't even get me started in the RZ616 and RZ717 Wi-Fi modules. In contrast, my first gen batch one framework 12 worked flawlessly with a supported Linux distro right out of the box, which is especially impressive for a two in one engineered primarily as a Windows first device. For that reason, I recommend new Linux users or anyone who doesn't want to manually configure hardware or dive into scripting, stick with one of the officially supported distributions. Fedora and Ubuntu are your best options and GNOME is the better desktop environment. Not only is it the default for both distros, meaning tighter integration, but it still has a slight edge over Plasma in two-in-one support. And while GNOME might stray further from the traditional Windows look and feel, I've always felt that it makes a cleaner, more intuitive laptop experience. Once you get the hang of two, three, and four finger gestures, it's hard to go back. Now, if Framework ever decides to offer a core boot across its entire lineup and start shipping laptops with Linux pre-installed and properly configured, they could easily shoot to the top of the Linux first list. Thanks to their modular design and full catalog of replacement and upgrade components, they're in position to outshine true Linux first companies like System76, Tuxedo, Star Labs, and Purism. For now, I'll say this, the Framework 12 still feels overpriced or under spec, whichever way you look at it, as a Windows 11 device, but as a fully supported Linux 2-in-1, especially considering my past frustrations getting other convertibles to play nice with Linux, I'm almost ready to say it's worth the extra money, especially for someone new to Linux, if you can get past the shortcomings I pointed out in my initial review. And honestly, there just aren't many true convertible competitors in the Linux space. The Star Lab Starlight 5 is the only one that comes to mind. So if this video outperforms my initial Framework 12 review in views, likes, and comments, and helps bring in at least a thousand new subs before my next upload, I'll buy a Starlight 5 and do a full head-to-head -head comparison. So if you found this helpful, give it a like, drop your questions, or share your distro experiences with the Framework 12 in the comments, and hit subscribe so you don't miss the Starlight Showdown if we get there. In the meantime, explore more, tinker more, own your tech. Thanks for watching.